Coming in at number 10 is Sync. Sync has the mutant ability of power mimicry, meaning, like Rogue, Sync can copy the powers of other mutants. Unlike Rogue, Sync has the benefit of not doing harm to whoever he is borrowing powers from, and he can also do it without physical touch. Recently, though, after being resurrected, Sync got a bit of a power boost, and he may even become a new Omega level mutant. In the story, Sync not only uses his normal mutant powers to replicate the abilities of the mutant Sunfire and Cyclops while they were both nearby, but is also able to tap into Jean Grey's telekinetic abilities while she is literally all the way chilling on Mars. Sync's growth in power post resurrection was first noticed back in 2021's X Men number 18, with Sync documenting that he was now able to sync not just with mutants, but other superhumans as well, which is quite the boost, and I think it just keeps going up and up and up. In the House of M alternate reality, Sync even got to the point of permanently retaining others' powers, which would be an incredible significant power boost as well. As a main member of the X-Men though, it's kind of hard to be surprised he's getting power boosts. So. At number 9 is iBoy. iBoy is usually undervalued because he looks really silly. And I get it. He does look like if the drummer for Kings of Leon had 57 eyes. But you should never judge a book by its cover because although iBoy doesn't look very menacing and seems rather confused most of the time, he's actually got a pretty good power set. He's got the ability to see just about anything, no matter how small and no matter how far. But on top of his microscopic and telescopic vision, he can also see basically every light wave there is, including x-ray, infrared, and thermal, among many others, including the magical plane as well. He also has night vision and even chemical detection. That's right, he can see pheromone secretions from people, giving him a tracking ability as well. iBoy is just one of those sad cases where he's just too unsettling looking to really garner much respect for who he really is and what he's truly capable of. Number 8. Domino Nina Thurman is a mutant weapons expert and mercenary. Under the name Domino, she was introduced in the early 90s as a member of X-Force. Domino is a survivor of a bunch of unethical scientists who are trying to create the perfect weapon. Tale is old as time, really. But this means Domino has all the talents and skills you would expect of an expert mercenary or secret agent. But we're here to talk about powers, and Dominoes are unique to say the least. Domino has probability manipulation powers, meaning she is almost always lucky. She exudes, at all times, a subconsciously activated field that alters the probability of occurrences in her line of sight in her favor. This means that whenever she is stressed, excited, or focused on something, things will go improbably well for her, and quite poorly for her opponents. Now there is a caveat to this. She needs to actively be trying to help herself for her power to work. So like, if debris is falling from the sky and was about to hit her on the head, she would still be hurt if she just stood still. But if she she tried to avoid that debris, she would move perfectly to avoid each and every piece about to hit her. Now the full potential of Domino's abilities hasn't actually been fully realized yet. And Marvel has a knack for updating powers whenever they want. But with an ability to be lucky, there's only a finite amount of things you can't do. At number 7 we've got Forget Me Not. Forget Me Not might also be a case of people judging a book by its cover because he doesn't really look too menacing, if we're being honest. But to be fair, his powers do also sound pretty lame at face value, so it could be that. Basically, this mutant can't be remembered by anyone he meets once he's out of sight. And as sad as this must be for him in his personal life, Forget Me Not can use this power to his advantage in a huge way in the right circumstances. In one case, he's even able to dupe all of X-Force when the team has to form an elaborate plan just to track him down. They're only able to finally catch him by having Dr. Nemesis record himself explaining to the team the existence of Forget Me Not as they search for him. And they keep watching it over and over again on their coffee breaks. And the only caveat to this whole situation is that the maintenance bots along with, I'm assuming, any computer automated system can remember Forget Me Not, which sort of weakens the potential for his powers in a way. So although he's more powerful than you might think, he's still got some vulnerabilities, but heck, everyone does, right? Forget me not. Number 6. Dust 
Created by Grant Morrison and Ethan Van Skyver for 2002's new X-Men number 133, Soraya Kadir is a young Muslim mutant who's enrolled in the Xavier Institute for Higher Learning. Now, she has largely been just a background character in the story she shows up in, but Dust has been present for some of the largest events in recent X-Men history. Soraya was even one of the mutants who kept their powers after M-Day. Soraya is usually a pretty shy and quiet girl, but don't let that fool you. Her powers are no joke. Dust is able to transform into a cloud of sand or dust and even act as a violent sandstorm, literally stripping the flesh from her opponents. When she couldn't properly control her powers yet, Dust even unintentionally flayed two men alive after unleashing her power in an act of self-defense. Dust has also been shown to use her power internally, meaning like inside another person, entering her enemy's lungs and eroding them from the inside out, which is just a lovely thought. But wait, there's more. It also appears that Dust is immune to magic and telepathy based attacks in her sand form. The only problem is that if you pull out a hose or like a super soaker or something, she's pretty much done as she's extremely vulnerable to water. She's a powerful mutant, but sorely underutilized. At number five, we have Mero. I've covered this mutant in almost every one of my lists for the last few weeks now, and for good reason. She is just such an underappreciated mutant considering how versatile and Honestly, cool her powers are. And if you are a Marrow diehard fan, you know that she's had some difficulties with her powers, which might explain part of the reason why people tend to write her off. Initially, Mero is unable to control the growth of her bones, which leaves her with some pretty painful and frankly terrifying looking struggles. But these days, she's honed her powers and has become quite impressive as a result. Her extreme bone growth allows her to eject super durable spikes from her skin, and then she can use them as weapons. She is adept at hand-to-hand -hand combat, so this, paired with her ability to literally grow her own weapons and then heal up without issue makes her pretty unstoppable. Number four, Jubilee. Jubilee's energy plasmoids might actually be one of the most potent of the X-Men's arsenal. The plasmoids aren't fireworks, even though they look a hell of a lot like them. They're actually closer to superheated plasma. She can create a bolt of bright light, but she can also push out enough power to bend steel or destroy a tree. And with precision, can even detonate microbursts inside someone's brain. So that's the amount of range we're talking about here. But that ain't all. It goes even beyond that. As Jubilee's Generation X instructor, Emma Frost, once speculated, if wielded properly, Jubilee could detonate objects on a subatomic level, meaning this unassuming mall rat can cause explosions of atomic proportions. She's a highly underrated character in the comics and gained a lot of popularity in the 90s thanks to the X Men TV show. And while she's gone in and out of having powers, she still remains one of the cooler characters in the X Men's lineup. At number three is Morph. Morph might sometimes be underestimated because of his funny disposition and his somewhat harmless look. With one of the best personalities out of all the mutants in my opinion, Kevin Sidney uses humor to work through his internal issues after his mother's death. But externally speaking, he deals with his other issues using his totally underrated power set. Morph is a master shapeshifter, capable of changing his body and his voice to mimic those of others. Not to mention, he's also able to fly at speeds of 40 miles per hour and has a healing factor due to his ability to manipulate the makeup of his molecules. But what's coolest about his powers is that if he chooses to grow more muscles, his strength will actually increase along with his appearance. And even if he can't get his strength up to match his opponent, his defensive stats are insane due to his ability to absorb the impact of any physical projectiles by simply allowing them to pass through him. Number two, Gambit. Gambit has the really cool mutant ability of molecular acceleration, allowing him to convert the potential energy of a non-living object through touch and kinetically excite the molecules to the point that they explode. Usually when a mutant has an ability that manipulates molecules, they have a pretty vast array of powers. But for Gambit, he mainly uses his abilities as attacks, charging up his signature playing cards and bow staff. But in an alternate universe, there is a future variation of Gambit known as New Sun, who is what Gambit would be if he reached the full potential of his power. He can manipulate kinetic energy down to a molecular level. 
meaning New Sun can charge objects and living beings without being in contact with them. He can stop objects that are in motion and make still objects begin moving. He can turn into a wave of energy letting him travel through space and other dimensions and he was even able to defeat the Dark Phoenix in his own universe by himself. We do see 616 Gambit use a lot of the same abilities as New Sun in a fight between the two in Gambit's 1999 solo series. But just knowing the potential this awesome Cajun sensation can reach, ooh, it's spicy. At number one is Chamber. Chamber is another underrated mutant with a power set that isn't quite appreciated the way it should be. It may have something to do with the trauma that Jonathan Starsmore goes through to acquire his powers, and further how that experience hinders him from achieving certain goals that other more accomplished mutants are able to. Basically, Chamber has what's described as a furnace of psionic energy stored in his chest. And when his powers are first discovered, this energy explodes out of him, destroying the lower half of his mouth and blowing a hole in his chest cavity, forcing him into intensive surgery to reconstruct the lost body parts. Eventually, he hones his powers to a point where he can aim psionic blasts on command, which is kind of like Cyclops, except in this case it's coming out of a hole in his chest. But what's more is is that Chamber later learns that he's in fact a descendant of Apocalypse, and he is eventually properly reconstructed by Clan Akaba in the appearance of Apocalypse. Although this leads him into a depression, Chamber then gets a huge power boost from this modification and changes his name to Decibel before joining the New Warriors. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Multiple Man. James Madrox, he made his first comic book appearance in Giant Size Fantastic Four, issue four, and right off the bat, he seems very very soft spoken, he seems very gentle. I mean the thing is yelling at him and he's literally like, why do you reject me? Why? Like he's so almost poetic in a way. And then when the thing goes to clobber him, bam, there's multiple more men. Now he wasn't used very much in the X-Men, but he spent most of his days with X-Factor, but this guy is underrated. His powers may seem kind of weak compared to somebody like Jean Grey, but these duplicates can each make a duplicate. Let me try something. Look at me! Hi. At one point, this guy had 40 of him running around town. 40! Now, the duplicates think, they feel, and they act independently, but they're guided by the original James Madrox. In a way, they're guided. They like kind of know what to do. Each of these duplicates manifests one aspect of James' personality, and the longer the time away, the more those traits become extreme. And if one of these duplicates passed away, he can sense that the general area where the body is, which is like the saddest radar ever. This guy could take over the world if he wanted. It would be like that scene from The Matrix, but with more monologues probably. And before we go on to this list of X-Men, you probably wouldn't expect to be that powerful. Guys, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, just right there, just give it a little tap tap, and it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get back to the list. Lickety split. Number nine, Darwin. We saw this next mutant for a hot minute in X-Men First Class. He was played by Eddie Gathegi, who unfortunately didn't survive too long. See, he threw his life down on the line in order to protect his fellow X-Men. And this was still in the early days too, what a champ. He first showed up in the comics in 2005 with X-Men Deadly Genesis issue two. Armando Munoz looked a lot different than we saw on screen as well. Since he was four years old, he was bald, his arms were super long, and his eyes were changing. He sure looks a little bit different than the young, handsome actor that we saw in the movie. His ability comes in handy a lot, actually, more so in the X-Men movies. See, in the comics, he's practically immortal. His ability once allowed him to survive Hela's death touch. I mean, it's a little bit different than the last time we saw him, that's for sure. Number eight, Caliban. An albino mutant and former member of the Morlocks, Caliban made his first comic book appearance in Uncanny X-Men 148. So he has the ability to track down any mutant. He actually sacrifices himself in the movie Logan, where Stephen Merchant played him. He was also in X-Men Apocalypse for a bit too, played by a different actor. He was played by Tomas Lamarcus. He was originally an ally to the X-Men, but once he became a tracker for Apocalypse in X-Factor issue 24, titled The Fall of the Mutants. So he's pretty powerful, and he's done a lot of cool stuff too. He may seem like a gentle, lanky, pale man, but when Caliban is stressed out in the comics, he gains two additional powers. 
super strength, and fear absorption. So if you put him in a corner, he'll be able to absorb the psionic energy in your fear and use it to power himself up even more. Number seven, Glob Herman, AKA Robert Herman, although Glob is much more fun to say. He made his debut at New X-Men issue 117, and he grew up with a father who despised mutants, so already he's off to a pretty rocky start. So when Glob mutated, his father was just not on board, so his mother drove Glob out to Westchester and just left him for Professor X. Like you leave a baby at a fire station. It's just like, yep, here you go, your problem now. This mutation was interesting. So his skin was this transparent living wax, which he's able to maintain being on fire, which is pretty amazing off the bat. You can light him on fire and he's good to go. That's amazing. He runs with the new mutants now, and although his name is Silly and he's literally a glob, he can also possess powers of super strength and super speed, despite how he may look. So he can get hit by these massive bombs like it's nothing, then he can fight whoever launched that bomb with ease. The X-Men literally once used him as a heat shield once, they strapped glob to the front of their ship and it didn't seem pleasant for a man glob but he was good he didn't die or anything he was just he had to rest for a bit number six toad when you think of the name toad in relation to a superhero you're going to picture something pretty silly in your head and mortimer tonby isn't that far off from what you think he made his first appearance in uncanny x-men issue four so he hops around which seems silly but his legs are so strong that he can leg press three tons and it's not just his legs that are strong his upper half possesses superhuman strength as well. His arms can lift about one ton. He also has flexible bone structure, regenerative healing factor, infrared vision, and the best part, his 30 foot long tongue can also act as a whip. And it can secrete venom that can give him mind control over your body. And his saliva is acid as well. Number five, Wither. Making his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 3, Kevin Ford grew up thinking that he was cursed, or he was the most unlucky person ever, one or the two. See, his mutant power started manifesting, and then he noticed it first in his plants, and then he noticed it in his clothes, and then he noticed it in people. So what would happen is his plants would wither. They would wither and they would die. And then his clothes were starting to decay as well. So once his father figures out this mutation, he tries to calm him down, but coming into contact with him, Obviously, the inevitable happens. He sees the world in this lifeless or decaying way now. See, it's part of this mutation. He can disintegrate all forms of organic matter just by one touch. Whatever he touches withers, so now we get his name. It turns into dust within seconds, whatever it is. Now, this seems boring, I guess. When you think of it in like a cinematic battle, it's not too exciting, but this guy can take out an entire elite squad just by touching them. I mean, realistically, just send him in always. No one's gonna expect it. All you have to do is get him to fist bump everybody and then bam, just like that, no more bad guys. Number four, Nocturne. This next one, she comes from Earth 2182, where she's the daughter of Nightcrawler and Scarlet Witch. Now, she's got her dad's looks, unfortunately. She's blue, furry, she's got three fingers and three toes. She's got a tail and yellow eyes and pointed ears. Now, sure, she looks like she can take out any bad guy, like she looks like an alien. So she possesses the powers of both of her parents. She can blast off energy bolts, she can climb walls, but what makes her even more powerful is that she has the ability to possess others for 12 hours or one lunar cycle. But once that timer is up, the victim is just completely out of it for 24 hours, just comatose. This super offspring packs a super punch, that's for sure. Number three, Tattoo. Christine Cord made her comic book debut in the new X-Men issue 126. She was a student of the Xavier Institute and she's known as Tattoo, well, because her mutation allows her to display messages or designs on her skin and she can phase through matter, which is also kind of fun. She's pretty awesome. I mean, when you first think of her, you may just think of the skin messages and be like, oh, whatever, maybe she's a spy. Maybe she can be like, send help and then use her skin. Cool, that's good. But check this out. Tattoo actually phased her hand into Cyclops' head once and told him that if she becomes solid, he would not survive to see the end of it. How awesome is that? But she sadly lost her powers during the events of M-Day, but if you ever ran into Christine again, she would probably surprise you with her new ability. When she was released from jail, she joined the new warriors and was given her own stilt man armor, becoming Longstrike. So bam, two and one, talk about underrated. Number two, Banshee. The Screaming Banshee, okay. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 28. Sean Cassidy was born as the heir to the castle and estate of Cassidy Keep, Ireland. Now, Professor Xavier asked him to join the X-Men at the same time as Thunderbird, and they both stayed as members of the new X-Men. Now, he went on to train the new generation of X-Men in Generation X, but he sadly lost his life during Deadly Genesis, 
when he was trying to stop Blackbird from crashing when it was taken over. So when you think of an X-Men who screams so loud he can hurt people, eh, it's impressive on its own, sure, but his screams are actually stronger than we really think. His screams can actually break through an inch of steel. And with these wings that Professor X developed for him, he's able to harness his power and use his screams as energy to help him fly. So he can do so much more with his voice as well. He can tighten the sound waves around himself to make a sonic shield, and he can influence your subconscious by changing the tones and vibrations of his voice. He can literally change your mind. How awesome is that? What do you mean you want a divorce? Uh... And finally, number one, we have my favorite on the list, Bailey Hoskins. Okay, I have to talk about this poor kid, okay. Strongest X-Men you wouldn't expect, yeah, that is for sure Bailey Hoskins. The only appearance of this kid is in the 2016 miniseries, X-Men, Worst X-Man Ever, which is a pretty cruel name. He was a student at Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, and his power is pretty spectacular. He can self-detonate, he can make himself explode, and you would never expect it just by looking at him. I mean, come on. He reminds me of Hogarth from the Iron Giant. He's such a cute kid. At number 10 is Bishop. Lucas Bishop is a mutant from the far-flung dystopian possible future where Hope Summers wiped out millions of human beings, resulting in the hunting and policing of mutants by sentinels under control of the government. From just this alone, his knowledge of possible future events, he has a large amount to offer. But Lucas Bishop also served as a member of the XSE mutant police force, giving him a whole whack of experience using his abilities. Speaking of which, Bishop has the very useful mutant ability of energy absorption, allowing him to absorb the majority of types of energy including magic, sound, light, psionic, psychic, and the list goes on and on, with no clearly defined limit as of yet. The energies he absorbs can be either environmental or directed towards him as a tax. He can then store or project that energy from his body in different ways, whether in the form of concussive blasts, energy rays, explosions, fire, plasma, and again the list goes on and on, but his favorite use is by projecting the energy out of his XSE weaponry. The nature of his powers makes it difficult to damage him with energy based attacks and almost any attack to be honest, giving him nigh invulnerability. But it also enables him to work well with any energy using teammates. Bishop can also store the absorbed energy within his personal reserves whereupon the energy increases his strength, speed, stamina, and healing abilities. He is highly underutilized, especially recently, and I think that's gotta change. Alright, at number 9 is Polaris. Lorna Dane is not just a green scarlet witch, okay? In fact, she is the real legit daughter of the anti-hero magnetic powerhouse Magneto. She's been manipulated, used, and been the victim of villains like Mesmero, Eric the Red, the Marauders, Saladane, and Apocalypse. But she has been a member of the X-Men and more recently is a key member of the newest version of the team. She's always been prominent but I think a little overlooked in comparison to others, which is a shame. She's actually quite powerful. As the daughter of Magneto, Polaris actually has pretty much exactly the same abilities as him. She can control and manipulate magnetic fields, allowing her to create force fields, fly on the Earth's magnetic field, emit magnetic concussive pulses that can overload and short circuit electrical systems. She's able to manipulate the natural iron within the blood of living organisms, allowing her to reverse the flow of an entire crowd's blood in order to render them unconscious. She controls metal and magnetism, just like her father, but hasn't had as much experience, so her potential has not been fully realized as of yet. Number 8, Forge. Forge has been an important member of the X-Men and mutant community for a long, long time. But for some reason, he always seems kind of unused, at least to me. He is almost like the X-Men's version of Q from James Bond. His mutant ability is that he is an intuitive genius. He can visually perceive mechanical energy, quote unquote, in action. He can just understand how something works by looking at it, as easily as breathing, for example. This power allows Forge to instinctively know and understand the potential and functional operations of any machine or technological device in his visual range. It's a skill that that combined with his natural intelligence allows him to conceive, design, and build mechanical devices and operate, modify, and disassemble existing technology to create countermeasures for it. It's pretty cool. It's almost hard to explain how this is a power, but it is. It's allowed him to subconsciously invent and construct something where someone else would have to think about it, design it, and then create it. He's been able to just do it, and then deconstruct it later to figure out how it actually works. He's created cybernetic systems, sophisticated 
holograms and elaborate computer and, and fiber optic systems as well as time travel devices. His potential is vast and that's before you take into account his magical affinity. And at number 7 is Dazzler. Dazzler, otherwise known as Allison Blair, is a mutant with the ability to transduce sound into light. She's also a very gifted singer and performer which she uses in tandem with her powers to just blow people's minds at her concerts. But she is more than that. She can take any source of sound other than her own voice, and unless it's projected back at her, as light energy which she stores up and can use in a bunch of really cool ways. Obviously using the lights she admits she can blind adversaries, but she can also create therapeutic light to help allies. Her dazzle blast, which is either the worst name ever or the best name ever, is a light show so intense it overwhelms the nervous system of whoever is watching and can knock people out. She can also shoot lasers that can cut through solid metal and photon blasts that strike with concussive force. She can create quote unquote light fog to hide allies. She can create force fields for offensive and defensive purposes and she can even fly. She's become the Herald of Galactus in a what if comic and she was actually one of the more impressive versions of Thor from God Doom's Thor Corps, even coming over to the 616 reality at one point. Dazzler is awesome and very underused. Coming in at number 6 is Mimic. As a child, a nosy and curious Calvin Rankin accidentally exposed himself to one of his father's experiments. Altering his body and triggering his powers, Calvin soon discovered he was able to mimic the abilities of others who were in his close proximity. He first appeared as an adversary to the original X-Men, copying and mimicking all their powers at once. After he reformed, he was offered a role on the team. Now, As a member of the X-Men, Mimic didn't really get along too well with his fellow teammates, but he was was one hell of a powerful asset to them and was responsible for a few of the team's victories. Cyclops resigned as leader shortly after Calvin joined and weirdly, Professor X chose to make Mimic the team's leader. Over time, other powers he has copied include the powers of Hulk, Banshee, Marrow, Gambit, Rogue, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, Baron, Megan, Kylan, Micromax, Rachel Summers, Wolfsbane, Pete Wisdom, Psylocke, Risque, Siren, Warpath, Sunspot, Cable, Caliban, Domino, Boom Boom, Richter, Cannonball, Shatterstar, Post, Blob, Mystique, Toad, members of the Crazy Gang, and so many others. The thing about Mimic in comparison to Sync or Rogue is that he copies skills and abilities as well as powers, and even Mimic's physical attributes which gives him a degree of more versatility at the cost of lower power levels. But he's still really cool. Number 5 Multiple Man Multiple Man has such a crazy interesting power. Okay, so I should say for starters that he isn't technically a mutant. Jamie or James Madrox is actually a changeling, which is a sort of genetic precursor for mutants who gain their abilities at birth instead of having their X gene activated later on. Like in puberty or whatever. For James, his power is that of duplication. He can duplicate himself multiple times upon impact and each of his dupes can create one single dupe. One of the real benefits of his power though is that the prime Madrox will retain any memories of his dupes experiences. So let's say you had to read like 10 books in a week. Well, you could have like 10 dupes all read one book each, and then when they re merge with you, you have all of their memories of each book. If that makes sense. Multiple Men is like an information gathering powerhouse. He can also use the ability to learn skills, like one of his dupes trained as a Shaolin monk and trained in meditation. One was a trained EMT, one audited an anatomy class for six months, one passed the New York bar exam, one claimed to be the world's greatest detective, and just stuff like that. In his self title coming from 2018, he even goes into a future world that is completely ruled by Madri, which is the plural for Jamie's dupes. I'd love to see his potential shown in the MCU or something, it would just be so entertaining. And at number four, Blink. Do you know in the beginning of the X Men Days of Future Past live action movie when there's that really cool fight scene in the bunker between some mutants and the ultra advanced sentinels. Now you know that mutant that was firing out portals and stuff and doing all that jazz? That is Blink and she is so cool. Clarice Ferguson's power has a few different uses. Obviously there are the bright pink portals, but she can also throw that same energy as a sort of missile that will teleport those or even parts of those that she hits. The range of her power is actually quite impressive as it has a potential range of as far as the moon and back, which is 
pretty freaking far, if you know. With the potential of her abilities and the cool way it is used, and even just how awesome it looks, you'd think she would have done a lot more, but she seems to not really have a whole lot of meaningful appearances. Except, if you want to see her being as amazing of a character as she should be, find her in Age of Apocalypse. So cool. Number three, Firestar. Another pretty powerful mutant who just hasn't had any key moments to speak of. Angelica Jones, also known as Firestar, has the awesome mutant ability of microwave energy manipulation and generation. She uses the Earth's electromagnetic field and converts it into microwave radiation. She also absorbs microwave radiation from her environment and from stars in the galaxy. She can then focus this energy at targets or to do different things. She can set targets on fire, explode them, and even melt them. She is consistently keeping her powers in check because she has the potential to damage the entire Earth and its atmosphere with her abilities, which is why she is even more powerful in space, where she isn't limited by the fragility of the Earth. Out in the cosmos, she has been able to easily produce an attack that injured Garth and Saul when he possessed the energy of the entire Nova Corps. And she also used her abilities to power a massive Shi'ar interstellar transport gate with very, very little effort. She's even been able to disrupt the psionic powers of others using her own power. Most impressively, Emma Frost. She is still young and learning to use her powers, but she needs to be more than just one of Spider-Man's friends because she is a powerhouse of potential. And at number two is Husk. Paige Guthrie is part of a family that has a lineage of mutant abilities. Sam Guthrie Cannonball, Joshua Guthrie Icarus, Melody Guthrie Arrow, and Jebediah Guthrie who doesn't have a superhero name. Paige's power is a wee bit unorthodox though. She has the ability to shed her skin and by concentrating on specific chemicals or elemental formulas, she can cause the layer of skin underneath to be a different element or shape or state. She can become any solid that she has studied and can imitate metal, diamond, granite, wood, rubber, and even glass. She's been shown to turn into a sharp toothed lizard once, which is weird. She doesn't have perfect control over her abilities at this point in time, but when she transforms, she obviously gains different abilities depending on what she turns into. She's granted herself super strength and durability, flame generation, and many other different things. Her shedding lets her get rid of dirt or sweat and even minor injuries, which is both cool and kind of a little freaky, but you know. she has all kinds of potential if she is given the time to properly train her powers. And in at number one, Megan or Megan or Megagan or however you want to say it. If you were a fan of Excalibur in the late 80s and early 90s, then you'll likely know who Megan is. That's with two G's. Megan is a unique character like most of the mutants are. She's a mutant empath with the ability to shapeshift but she is also an elemental of great power and she's even got a dose of fairy heritage. Her list of abilities is a little hard to define as it is with most shapeshifters and it can even be augmented by her connection with the earth. She is transformed into a Godzilla like dragon that could breathe fire and even a werewolf like creature with all the enhancements that can afford. Megan has also shown through her environmental connection and mutant empath abilities to be able to adapt to situations and also to the emotions of those around her. So for example, she can grow gills and fur, or become prettier when those around her think she is ugly. She can also turn into other superhumans as well, gaining their powers but with less potential. Which even worked when she became a female version of the Silver Surfer, which is kind of nuts. She is resistant to reality warping powers and she even has a true form where she can manipulate elements, fly, and manipulate magical energies. She is a highly capable mutant and character, she just hasn't really done a heck of a lot since the 90s, and that's a shame. Kicking off the list at number 10, M. Monet St. Croix made her first appearance in Generation X issue 1 as Penance, and by the time issue 40 rolled around, she was introduced as Monet. She was the second child of Ambassador Cartier St. Croix, who was a wealthy former president of numerous corporations. Now, although she had an older brother and two young twin sisters, her father still favored her. Now, her brother Marius had mutant abilities, and when they manifested, he became evil, sadly. He actually took out his mother and was kicked out of the family, and then he asked Monet to join him, traveling through other dimensions, gaining power. She was like, nope, 
I'm good, thanks. So she rejected him, and Marius trapped her in this form of a mute creature with diamond hard red skin. And he fed on her powers. What a not nice guy. It's awful. So Claudia and Nicole, her sisters, the twins, they joined forces. Like, literally. They merged into a new version of Monet. And it was all pretty much the same personality, appearance, and powers. M is a telepathic genius, and of course, super strength and super speed sure does help her get the job done. Before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It does help our channel quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go right back into this list. I don't want to waste any more time. Number nine, Frenzy. Okay, Joanna Cargill. She made her first debut in X Factor issue four. Now, she accidentally punched her father so hard that her hand went through his chestal plate which is just a great way to find out you have powers. Now her father was in no means a good person at all, but still finding out you're a mutant in that way is pretty rough. That's pretty traumatizing for a young kid. So she became known as Frenzy and she joined the Allegiance of Evil. Now after the Acolytes disbanded, Joanna became ambassador for Genosha and stood by Magneto until she was captured by the US government in order to learn more about Magneto, but she didn't talk. She was a tough one. She didn't talk until Jean Grey entered and freed her, giving her the option to join the X-Men the easy way or the hard way. Jean used the hard way and then Frenzy's entire attitude was changed. Her personality was like campy, it was awkward, not nearly as confident as before, but her powers were still there. She did help the X-Men find Magneto's base. She was a team member, even if it was forced and campy. So after Magneto's defeat, her mind control was released and she rejoined the Acolytes and then left the X-Mansion. Super speed, super strength, super stamina, super everything, you name it, she's got it. Her body has been described as being hard as steel, making the She-Hulk put up quite a fight. Number eight, armor. Hisako Ichiki made her first appearance in Astonishing X-Men Volume 3, Issue 4. Now, she grew up in Japan before joining the Xavier Institute. She formed a close relationship with Wing and Blindfold once she joined Kitty Pride's Paladin Squad. Now, her new close friends were being attacked one day by Ord of Breakworld, so Armor used her unique mutant abilities to take care of him with a mighty punch. She can create the psionic exoskeleton suit of armor, hence the name armor. It's fueled by the energy of Hisako's ancestors. In the Ultimate Universe, her abilities create quite the spectacle as well. They appear in the shape of these massive animals, these great beasts, even dragons at some point. As if these abilities weren't surprising and fantastic enough, she also received combat training from Wolverine and tactic training from Cyclops. So she's kind of a big deal. Number seven, Vulcan. He named himself after the Roman god of fire, but Vulcan's real identity was that of Gabriel Summers. He was born after Cyclops and Havoc, well, not really. He wasn't really born. He was actually surgically removed from his mother's body and placed in an incubator accelerator, then aged to be at his prime and then sent to Earth to work for Dak and Shikari. One of those normal childhoods, you know? So he escaped and he was found by Mora McTaggart with no memories of who he is or where he came from. Poor kid. So we asked for Charles' help and then all Kid Vulcan wanted to do was learn about his mutant abilities. Sounds like the perfect student. Like, come on, you're doing all the right things. Charles needed help from him and other newcomers to find the remaining X-Men. So Charles put him in this danger room as a training exercise to get them sharp in a short amount of real time. So it felt like months of training, but in fact, it's only a few hours. And then Vulcan and this new team were sent to Krakoa to rescue the original X-Men. But Vulcan revealed to Scott that Xavier sacrificed his own brother to save him. Number six, Maggot. That's a fun name right off the bat, Maggot. Maggot, or I mean Japeth, first appeared in Uncanny X-Men issue 345. He was born with five siblings, but never grew at the same rate as them. And on top of that, he had struggled with pains in his stomach. Sadly, those pains turned out to maybe be cancer, and he feared that he would run his family dry with medical bills. So at just age 12, he left the South African village and started to think of a dark solution to his problem. Super tragic. So he ended up in the Kalahari Desert and was found by Magneto, who figured out that these stomach issues were actually these two slug-like creatures that lived in the boy's body, and they acted as his digestive system. Years later, Maggot reached out to Magneto in hopes that he would help him with this gross situation. Now the slugs, named Eeny and Meeny, because that's what you do when you have slugs, you give them cute nicknames, they were these sentient techno-organic slugs that could devour anything. Doesn't matter what kind of matter you are, gone, devoured. They would do it fast too, not at the pace of normal slugs. And once lunchtime was finished, they would return back to Japeth's stomach, transferring the energy from what they just consumed, granting him super strength and durability. Also, he had a nice avatar tan to go along with these magnificent abilities. Number five, Kid Omega. Now again, the word kid is used lightly in this list. You do not want to underestimate Quentin Choir aka Kid Omega. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 134. He's been described as one of the most powerful telepaths next to Jean Grey. So off the bat, 
you know you're in for a treat. He was one of Xavier's prized pupils. That is until, of course, he put together the Omega Gang, which was this gang that would handle humans after they've committed crimes against mutants. They would do it themselves, not in a poetic way, to say the least. They were like the super kid police. They even went to a tattoo shop and made it official. They got these Omega symbols tattooed over top of the X. Now his abilities are insane. He can manipulate your perception, judgment, wills, and common sense. He's able to track you down by listening to your thoughts, folks. Your thoughts, you can hear your thoughts. And even in this instance, if you were a telepath, you wouldn't see him coming because he would block out your powers to sneak up on you. One of the coolest things about Quentin is the psionic shotgun that he can create. It just looks cool. He just channels all this mental energy as this astral energy shotgun. And if that doesn't do the trick, yeah, the psionic rocket launcher should. Number four, Kubark, AKA Kid Gladiator, another kid. Kubark is the son of Emperor Gladiator. He was this young prince sent to Earth to train and discover more secrets about his powers. And the one place you go and do that is of course the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Warbird was his bodyguard. And the reason that he was sent to Earth, this new kid on the block, was because he destroyed more than half of the Shi'ar royal city on Shandalar just for fun, you know? In Wolverine and the X-Men, he arrives and starts giving orders to other students, like to bring him snacks, the whole thing. And he wanted these students to call him their new Imperial Overlord. He's jam-packed with superpowers though. He can possess the ability to fly and his eyes are pretty interesting, not just to look at. He has microscopic vision and can blast heat beams through those peepers. And with an incredible lung capacity, he can take in large amounts of air and blast it out, creating these hurricane-like winds. And if that doesn't work, he can use his breath to freeze you dead in your tracks. Number three, Lifeguard, AKA Heather Cameron. Lifeguard is such a cool character. Okay, let's talk about her. She's super unique. She made her first debut in Extreme X-Men issue six. And judging by her name, yes, she of course started off as a lifeguard and also as a surfer. Her mutant ability is that of a lifeguard, literally. Her powers allow her to manifest whatever is needed to save the life of somebody near her. If you're allergic to peanuts, bam, EpiPen, stab, we're good. She's like the super medic of the X-Men, she's awesome. After the events of M-Day, Heather was one of the lucky to retain her abilities. She's almost a combination of Darwin and Mystique. Now I talked about Darwin in part one of this list, so if you want a little bit of catching up to do, you know where to find that. Number two, Zeitgeist. Axel Clooney, he was seen in Deadpool 2 and he made his first comic book appearance in X-Force issue 116. His ability, mm, let's just talk about it. He can spit acid, like a lot of acid, so much acid. It can eat through any substance. And I think what makes this character even more wild is when he himself discovered these powers for the first time. Oh boy, okay. He was at the beach hanging out. He met this lovely woman. They clicked, it was romantic. They were nice, they were kissing on the beach. And then all of a sudden, this uh, this happens. A lot of acid puke, a lot of puke, real nasty stuff. Ugh. But this guy is super powerful. Like he can take on so many mutants. I mean, it's gross, but if only he didn't spew it out of his mouth, maybe he had fingers that could do the acid shooting, he would be less of a gag, pun intended. And finally coming in at number one, Jubilee. Making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men issue 244, Jubilee, AKA Jubilation Lee, first discovered her mutant power of generating these dazzling sparkles from her hands. She was always seen as this little sister type character from the start, but she packs a powerful pretty punch. She was discovered by Dazzler, Cycloc, Rogue, and Storm during a rescue at the mall. And when she followed the women back through a portal, she ended up at the X-Men's temporary base in the Australian Outback. Jubilee and Wolverine ended up becoming a good pair, working missions together, and they were a fun duo. Now her powers grew to a whole new level, when a vampire ended up infecting the area of Union Square. This happens in Curse of the Mutants, and Jubilee being caught in the path of this infection ended up becoming a vampire. It's, it's a pretty big deal. Even before the vampire stuff, this is a highly underrated character to this day. Coming in at number 10, it's Toad. Toad has been a member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and by extension, a part of the mutant community for a hot minute. But in my opinion, Mortimer Toynbee hasn't really been utilized as much as he should be given his massive list of abilities. Toad has a degree of superhuman strength, specifically in his back and legs, which allow the little weirdo to jump around 25 to 37 feet, and he'll kick you so hard you ain't getting back up. He's got flexible bone structure, superhuman stamina, durability, reflexes, and agility. Toad, like a lot of super beings has a regenerative healing factor, but unlike a lot of mutants, he has UV vision, a super strong 30 foot prehensile tongue, acidic saliva, sticky paralytical resin out of his pores, and pheromone secretion. I can understand why he isn't exactly at the top of the mutant landscape, partially because he's kind of really gross, and just overall in 
unpleasant, but he does have a hell of a lot of abilities to offer. Number nine, Ricochet. Now, I don't know if this is cheating, because you slap some web shooters, super strength, and the ability to do everything a spider can on this mutant, and you basically have Spider-Man. In fact, the superhero name and costume used by Jonathan Gallo was originally used by Peter Parker as a secondary superhero identity when Spider-Man was framed for ending someone's life. But enough about Webhead. Jonathan Gallo is a mutant with the abilities of superhuman agility and reflexes, with his agility allowing him to jump long distances, and when he combines his powers, he can almost bounce off walls in a sort of I don't know, ricocheting type movement? But that's not all. Ricochet also has another mutation in the form of his Danger Sense, which is totally not the same as Spider Sense, except it sort of is. It allows Jonathan to sense danger before it happens. Now with his agility, reflexes, and Danger Sense, this mutant possesses three of Spider-Man's more useful abilities, but he's just different and cool enough that I can still respect him as more than some cheap knockoff. Number eight, Lifeguard. Lifeguard, or Heather Cameron, arguably has one of the most useful mutant powers possible. Her ability is called Danger Detection Response, and basically what it means is that she can detect danger to her or others' lives in her vicinity, and she can literally evolve whatever powers are necessary for her to stop those lives from being lost. She can gain more than one power at a time, and is able to control said powers after just a few seconds. It also seems to be kind of limitless in what she can do. Her situation, biomorphic adaptations have taken the form of growing wings for flight, extra arms, Arms for carrying and super strength, her skin turning into a sort of golden metallic super awesome armor, gills for underwater breathing with her legs even turning into a fish tail for a better swimming ability, as well as simply upping her strength level from normal to superhuman. It's almost too fitting that she was an actual lifeguard before her powers emerged. She's a literal lifesaver. Number seven, Forearm. Michael McCain is the mutant under the name Forearm, an exceedingly clever name as this mutant's ability is that Forearm has four arms. Oh boy. <laughs> Alongside his four arms ability, forearm also has access to super strength, stamina, and durability. Because honestly, forearms isn't exactly going to save him in the majority of mutant conflicts. That being said though, I would kill to have two extra arms. I just can't help but imagine how useful that would be. Add to the fact that your arms are super strong, not only can you make a peanut butter jelly sandwich while texting your friends and petting a cat or something, but you can also trade two extra fists worth of punches with some heavy hitting mutants who only get two hands. For Michael, when his powers are used in unison with his extra limbs, he is a formidable close combat specialist, able to hold his own against some of X-Men's own powerhouses like Rockslide. He was a founding member of the Mutant Liberation Front and he is now happily living on Krakoa. Number six. Nature Girl. Although Lin Lee started off at Jean Grey's school for higher learning, after she witnessed some of the horrible things humanity is doing to the earth and to nature, she would instead become an eco fighting back against humanity, which makes sense given her powers. Nature Girl's powers are directly connected to the natural world, so she can communicate, influence, manipulate, and control nature, living beings, except I guess not humans or mutants, plants, natural phenomena like the weather and geology of the earth, and the matter and energy of which all these things are composed of. Now that statement alone kind of encompasses a lot of different stuff. She can call upon animals and ally herself with them. She can make plants grow, move, and attack people. She can control the weather to a degree and heal nature to a degree too. She was on the run from Wolverine for a while and was able to get away from him a few times using her abilities. And she looks totally awesome wielding the Krakoan cudgel with her big antlers and the goat legs and stuff. Super cool. Number five, Miranda. The only reason this character is on this list is because a lot of people have not heard of her. She doesn't even have a last name. Miranda had powers that appeared at first to be cosmic level reality warping. Warping on a level the beast created the term Omicron level mutant to call her. He thought she was able to manipulate reality while somehow completely avoiding any damage to space or time. Like when she has stopped the juggernaut in his path by making a well appear right below him that he was falling down millions of miles. But what Miranda's mutant power actually was, was control over all of Marvel's continuity. She is the one who has been keeping all of Marvel's mutants young. She's the reason the old Nick Fury got replaced by Samuel L. Jackson, and she's the reason Bucky Barnes came back as the Winter Soldier. At least, 
She is in this alternate universe of Earth TRN656, the one from X Men Worst X Men Ever. I'm just kind of curious to see if this ultra powerful mutant will ever show up in other stories or even the 616 universe at all. Number four, Banshee. Sean Cassidy has been around for one heck of a long time in the world of Marvel's mutant community, and he has done some pretty prominent things, but his power doesn't seem like it's all that impressive, and he is kind of looked over when thinking about the mutants, but he shouldn't be. Sean has acoustic kinesis, an ability he does many, many cool things with. Primarily, Sean emits a sonic scream. Now, the sound waves from this sonic scream have shattered solid objects, cracked skulls, and even liquefied people. But he has done so much more with this ability. He can ride the sound waves he creates using his suit to be able to fly at subsonic speeds. He can create sonar by sending out a pure signal note and listening to the returning sound. He can tighten the sound waves around himself and others to create sonic shields. And more than that though, he has been shown to affect the fluid inside people's ears with his sonic screams being able to set them off balance and even render them unconscious. One ability that had me raising an eyebrow is the fact that Banshee can even subtly influence people's subconscious mind by changing the tones and vibrations of his voice, effectively using hypersonic suggestions and persuasive abilities. Don't sleep on Banshee people. Number 3 North Star John Paul Bobier is an interesting mutant with a few different abilities. North Star's main ability is super speed. Not really in the traditional sense of running really fast though. North Star can propel his body at superhuman speed becoming a living projectile, channeling a portion of the kinetic energy of his body's molecules in a single direction. It's even possible for him to reach 99% the speed of light in a vacuum. But if he were to do it on earth or something, he not only damage himself but could quite possibly break the planet. He can also super speed any part of his body giving him superhuman reflexes and an incredibly fast metabolism to heal wounds. What's really cool is that since he is taking atomic motion from the muscles, his muscles become closer making him superhumanly durable, allowing him to survive moving at the speeds he does without tearing himself apart. He also uses his ability to fly by projecting the kinetic energy downwards which in turn lifts him upwards. Northstar used this ability to basically cheat as an Olympic skier which is kind of really unfair but whatever. And we haven't even talked about his photokinesis and concussive blasts yet and we're not going to so moving on. Number 2 Sage Sage is a super genius with a brain more powerful than any computer in the world, granting her perfect memory and rapid analytical abilities. She can come up with the perfect plan in an instant, learn just about any skill without having to practice it, remember everything she's ever experienced, perform multiple tasks at once by allocating a partition of her brain to each task, and thanks to training with Professor X, she can engage in telepathy. Her telepathic abilities allow her to detect minds and read them, project thoughts, astral projection, cast realistic mental illusions, and she even has a kind of psionic defense unique to her called her firewall. But it doesn't even stop there, as Sage even has some biokinetic abilities as well, including reading another mutant or person's genetic code and DNA, being able to literally see who someone's related to, jump starting latent or enhancing current mutant abilities, and has complete control over her physical body, being able to expel nanobots from her body by controlling her immune system, almost like highly advanced antivirus. She needs more time in the spotlight, like desperately. And in at number one is Negasonic Teenage Warhead. You may remember Ellie Fimister as the super angsty Negasonic Teenage Warhead from the Ryan Reynolds Deadpool movies. And while that character was both hilarious and awesome, she's kind of pretty different in the comics. Obviously she is still a teenager with that ridiculous yet awesome name, but her powers seem to be vastly different. Ellie's powers are psychically based and primarily take the form of precognitive nightmares nightmares and premonitions, meaning she sees the future, specifically she saw disasters before they happened which kind of explains the heightened teenage angst thing. But she would go on to start having glimpses of danger in the near future which allows her to plan ahead or avoid attacks. She also possesses other psychic abilities like telepathy, telekinesis, and has been able to levitate. But maybe strongest of all is her abilities of reality warping and particle manipulation and absorption. Plus some of the superhuman starter pack abilities including strength speed, durability, and reflexes, as well as just being an awesome character partially due to her texting movie counterpart. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Mimic. Calvin Rankin came into comics in X-Men 19. He was the son of a scientist, and when he was just a child, he knocked over a beaker, 
filled with this experimental chemicals, okay? Now this red gas emerged and he inhaled it, so now he has this amazing ability where he can mimic anybody else's powers. They just have to be standing close by. Now the team at first is trying to take him down, but they're failing, of course, as he's just adapting to their every move. So while this ability does sound like one of the best, it kind of just depends on who's near you. I mean, he's not too powerful, but he is. If you're the one that's powerful, that's near him. See what I mean? So if you're hanging out with Mimic, he may just seem pretty normal. That's because, well, shocker, you're just pretty normal. You can't fly, you can't shoot lasers out of your eyes. But if Cyclops came along, all of a sudden, this guy is totally different. You're still a boring human. Now he's another Cyclops. How unfair is that? And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does wonders for our channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's get right back into these crazy mutants. Number nine, not another teen mutant. Okay, this next one is a one-off, okay? He doesn't have a name exactly, so we'll just refer to him as Teen Mutant from now on. Not a Teen Mutant Ninja Turtle, just a Teen Mutant. Well, you'll see, it's kind of crazy. At first, he looks like a regular kid. He's got posters on his wall, one of which is Wolverine with the caption, be different right below it. But we'll talk about that a little later because uh, he may have taken that a little too literally. So he wakes up, he's ready for school. He's looking for breakfast. His mom is nowhere to be seen. Only a pile of her clothes remain on the ground. So he doesn't call the police, but rather he just writes a note, sticks it and then goes to school. If you ever wake up and there's just clothes left, call the police no matter what. That's That comes first. On the way to school, he sees there's just a collar lying on the sidewalk. Just a collar, no animal. Okay, odd. What's going on? Finally, he sees people. He's like, okay, great. I'm not going crazy. Whew, that was a close one. But I bet that he wished that that was the case after what's about to happen. So he has this neat ability where people just don't survive being close to him. They kind of explode. It's pretty gross. And he hears it from the guy in that poster himself. He hears it from Wolverine when he finds him ducking out in a cave. So what happened was when he hit puberty, he developed a specific mutation that radiates a series of toxins and acid-like poisons. So it wipes out any organic tissue in its way. It turns it into vapor. So the number of people that he ended up taking out that day was a whopping 265. And you thought he was just another blonde haired teen heartthrob. Think again. Number eight, El Guapo. This next one, I don't think I would even notice this mutant if he was standing right in front of my very eyes. Meet Robbie Rodriguez. He was the stuntman for X Statics, the movie. Now he saved the team from Sharon Ginsburg. She attacked because she blamed X Statics for the amputation of her wings. So in comes Robbie Rodriguez with his sentient skateboard to save the day. That's right, sentient skateboard, you heard me. He has no real powers himself, but he has this symbiotic skateboard that acts along with his mental commands, even subconscious thoughts sometimes. So the skateboard once beat him up for cheating on his girlfriend. So next time you see a dude at the skate park, just double check and see if it's Robbie Rodriguez, because you never know. Number seven, Anarchist. Tyke Alucard made his first appearance in X-Force issue 116. The same issue that had Zeitgeist origins as well, actually, which is in part two. If you haven't already seen it, I talk about him. He's the guy who pukes acid. Gross. But we also meet Tyke Alucard in this. So he said he doesn't want to go and give away all his secrets, but he's got something going on with his sweat. It's like acid. He could secrete acid from the pores of his body. And if there's enough of it, say that when he's fighting bad guys, it becomes this form of energy that he's able to blast out. He would blast these acid blasts. Like how insane is that? The guy makes acid brass knuckles. Brassed knuckles. He was a new addition to the team to replace Sluck, but they weren't a fan of him at first. They thought he was a risk, not a team player, high maintenance and mentally unstable. Although he pulled through for the team at the end of the day. Number six. Cypher. Douglas Ramsey came around with comics with New Mutants issue 13. Now he believes that language is power. And when we first meet him, he's a smart dude in a vest. He's got nice hair. He's talking about deciphering codes. We wouldn't expect too much from him. Maybe he's their guy in the chair. Either chair. Now Douglas is actually quite powerful. His ability allows him to communicate with any species. Written or spoken language doesn't make a difference. Doug's got your back, whatever language that is. He can also extend this ability to decipher codes and complex equations, leaving him a pretty powerful asset to any team. Number five, Eye Boy. Trevor Hawkins, again, one of those mutants where you can probably guess his mutation just on his name alone. Eye Boy is, yes, covered in eyes. 57 of them, to be exact. He made his first appearance in Wolverine and the X-Men issue 19. He was one of the new mutants that manifested their power after the Avengers vs. X-Men war. Then he enrolled in the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. So eye boy, okay, big deal. You walk up, you poke all of his eyes out, problem solved. We've played Zelda before, we know how to defeat this guy. Wrong. He is more than meets the eyes. Trevor can of course see you coming, and though his eyes can't shoot laser beams, they do have a plethora of unique abilities. I'm talking microscopic vision, telescopic vision, x-ray vision, 
night vision, infrared, thermal, chemical detection, you name it, he can see it. All these eyes will see you in any sense. He can even pick up on your body language quite well. Number four, Nature Girl. Lynn Lee made her debut in Wolverine and the X-Men Volume 2, Issue 1. And at first, she seems like a regular student, just maybe with antlers. Okay. So Nature Girl can control and bond with animals, which sounds pretty peaceful, if anything. Like, if I could control animals, I'd spend all my time in the woods. I'd just take a flute and I'd have a great time. Maybe even pack a lunch. It'd be lovely. With her powers, she can, of course, do that, but also go further. She can connect to the natural world and control all of nature. Living beings, plants, weather, the very geology of the earth, whatever the case is, she can control it. She can talk to plant lives as well. So if there's any plants that need some watering in your apartment, she'll let you know. And if Nature Girl needs to make a quick escape and there are no birds around to control, she herself can fly only for a limited time. Number three, Gold Balls. Fabio Medina made his comic book debut in X-Men Volume 3, but it wasn't until issue 11 that we got to meet Gold Balls. His powers came to be after somebody tried to rob him, then all of a sudden he started to generate these spheres, these gold balls, out of every part of his body. And whenever these bouncy gold balls hit something, they would make a boink sound which ought to be pretty annoying just as it is. So these gold balls were not made of gold, rather they were produced from infertile eggs. He's pretty outstanding as it is, but currently in the comics, he's referred to as Egg, which is more appropriate after he learned the true nature of his abilities. So Egg and these other members of the Five are tasked with resurrecting any mutants that have met their terrible fate. So Egg's eggs are a major key to this process. So he's not just all about, you know, being gold and having balls and stuff. Number two. Tag. Brian Cruz made his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 10. He was actually reborn thanks to that group of five that I just mentioned with gold balls. So Brian's powers are pretty amazing. I can see how one wouldn't expect him to be as powerful as he is. So he has what's called the pariah effect. So if he tags you, hence his name Tag, when he tags you, you become it. Then he uses this form of telepathy to make you emit the signal that causes everybody else to run away from you, just to leave your vicinity. Or they can run towards you, which is even scarier. And he can decide on that number of people affected as well. It could be one person chasing you, or it could be 200. Depends how many are near you. This effect stops after the victim reaches 100 feet. But still, that many people in that radius all running towards you? Like, what if it was Black Friday? It would be an absolute nightmare. Also, these people that are chasing you are fully aware of what's happening. They just can't control it, so... If that's not a nightmare, I don't know what is. And finally, number one, we have Summoner. Making his first appearance in X-Men Volume 5, Issue 2, The Summoner. The Summoner, at first, just looks like a mutant child. It's referring to its mother, so off the bat, you assume, okay, young. He's the son of Bracken and Apocalypse's first horseman of war. He was born 300 years ago on Arako, the highest ranking out of all the other Summoners. There were these wizards that can summon creatures of Arako. Now, his grandmother was taken out by the dark god of immense, Annihilation. So that's when the Amenthi Daemons destroyed Arako's towers and then attacked and wiped out all those mutants. Now the summoner is not just a pale child, he can summon a horde of elementals as well. And at number 10 is Beltane. Beltane is a mutant you may likely not have heard of. Her real name is currently unknown, but we know she was part of a group of Romani gypsies. She was captured by the Latvian monarch and awesome supervillain Dr. Doom and experimented on, which activated her latent mutant abilities, and also set off her desire to overthrow his rule with a group of other escapees. Now Beltane's ability is the secret weapon of her group. She has the ability of fear projection, which means that she can physically project a manifestation of whatever the person she is facing most fears, psychically messing with and almost torturing her victims. So when fighting Wolf Spain, for example, Beltane made the hero see a projection of her not so nice father. Probably a mistake as Wolf Spain eventually took her down in an animalistic rage, but hey, it's still a cool power. Coming in at number nine, Wolfsbane. Speaking of Wolfsbane, Rain Sinclair has the mutant ability that I wish I had when I was a kid. She can turn herself into a wolf at will and can even go into a transitional form that is basically a close to a werewolf without being a werewolf type of thing. In fact, she is basically a werewolf, but with none of the drawbacks of the monster. She retains all her faculties, minus not being able to talk and just being a little bit feral, and is not forced to change only at night. Rain grows much larger than her human form when she changes and gains access to some enhanced strength, which coupled with the body of a wolf, grants her enhanced speed and reflexes as well. She gains heightened senses similar to a wolf. The thing with Wolfsbane is that she is both a wolf 
and a human. So she gains the benefits of both, like almost stacking on top of each other. Unlike wolves, or humans for that matter though, she does have an enhanced healing factor and enhanced vision as well. So double thumbs up. Number 8, Abigail Brand. Abigail here is an interesting character. She is technically a human alien hybrid as her father hails from the planet Axis, but it's actually her human mother who Brand inherited her mutant abilities from that allowed her to join Shield and then Sword as an agent and hero. So what are said abilities? Well, she has a form of pyrokinesis known as tactile pyrokinesis, which means that Bran can coat at least her hands in flames that are potent enough to burn through most metals via tactile contact. She can use her abilities to warm up others, but has enough control that she can also set others on fire. So she has some versatility with set abilities. I somewhat kind of prefer her form of pyrokinesis because, I don't know, I just swear there are way too many fire based heroes who seem to all do similar things. So at least Abigail has her own brand of fire. Sorry, the dad jokes are in full force today. Number 7, Primal. Adam Berman first appeared in X-Men Unlimited number 16 in July 1997, and his story arc was one I actually had a good time reading. It was oddly unique, at least to me. Adam is a mutant, but his ability is a transformative one, and he can easily hide it, which allowed him to kind of play himself off as a non-mutant even though he was trying to join the Xavier Institute. That's what I gathered at least. It was kind of confusing. So you should read his story, but we are here for his abilities, not his story. And those set abilities almost remind me of other superpowered beings like the Hulk and even the Lizard. Because Adam can transform into a totally primal reptilian like form, growing about 50% bigger than his normal self and gaining red glowing eyes. But his physical enhancements are quite impressive. His strength boosts to around a level 10, with the highest level being a 100. But level 1 super strength is capable of pressing 800 pounds through a 25 ton range. So level 10 is nothing to scoff at. Look, just just go read his story, okay? Number 6, Adam X. Another Adam. Almost like I like that name or something. Adam Nuramani is honestly a bit more interesting than the last Adam though. He was a genetically created hybrid of both Emperor Deken of the Shi'ar Empire and Catherine Summers of Earth, created in an attempt to introduce more genealogies to the Shi'ar Empire. Now just as his origin is unique, so are his powers. Adam has the ability of electrokinetic hymopyrokinesis, or if you don't want to hurt yourself like I just did, you can also say sanguine combustion, which also sounds super Super cool. It basically means that he can send an electric surge through oxygenated blood, which leads to ignition of the electrolytes present in said blood, causing a person to burn from the inside out, which could result in a little subtle warming effect, or it could completely disintegrate a person. So there's a lot of wiggle room here, which is cool. But thanks to his Shi'ar side of things, he also has enhanced strength, agility, reflexes, stamina, speed, vision, and healing. So couple all that with his awesome fighting skills and the cool cybernetic retractable claws, and Extreme is someone you don't want to mess with. Coming in at number 5 is Shatterstar. So I was like this close to including Longshot on this list, but he doesn't even consider himself a mutant, and there's a whole bunch of weird time mojo verse stuff going on, so instead I'm going to do his father and or son, which is a whole other thing in itself. Look, all you need to know is we're talking about Shatterstar. Gavidra 7 learned the arts of battle as a warrior in arenas on Mojo World, where he developed both a sense of honor and incredible fighting skill, but those aren't his abilities. He possesses a large superhero starter pack. Superhuman strength, speed, agility, stamina, durability, senses, reflexes, agility, dexterity, coordination, balance, plus a regenerative healing factor, and even enhanced learning ability. Curiously though, he actually has hollow bones, which makes him a shim lighter than you would think he is, but also further boosts up his natural physical skills. The cool part of Shatterstar though are his Mojoverse swords, which he can use through his mutant ability to channel powerful 
powerful vibratory shock waves, which can be absolutely devastating, but also kind of drains him of energy. But after his mojo time, he can now create X shaped portals as well that have to be linked to another person who acts as an anchor for said portals. These also drain him of energy, and he has a cooldown of about like four days before we can do it again because this powerhouse needs some kind of balancing. Number four, Aurora. In the last part of this series, we talked about North Star, but that mutant has a sister. And guess what? Surprisingly, the mutant gene runs in the family. That shouldn't be surprising really because genes and all that. Hmm. Wow, this is a horrible intro. Janine Marie Bobier, otherwise known as Aurora, can generate a bright light, which according to the wiki is equivalent to half a million foot candles. Or if you aren't weird, it's about as strong as a lighthouse light, which is also an extremely weird frame of reference, but I digress. She and her brother can both do this by varying the rate of acceleration of the molecules of their bodies out of phase with one another, thereby generating a cascade of photonic discharges. The light can actually do some interesting things, like she can make a calming light that can even interrupt psychic control, or she can make concussive light blasts. Or, which is even cooler, she can even create lightning blasts that actually do some considerable damage. Like her brother, she can also move incredibly fast, and thanks to her molecular manipulation, she can also be extremely durable, heal quickly, and even withstand all the g-force of moving so fast without doing those insane weird breathing exercises that pilots have to do. Number 3, Phantom X. I honestly kind of dread talking about Phantom X, but I also completely love this guy. When I first read a comic with him in it, I did not fully understand his power, and I still don't really. So now I'm gonna try and explain something to you that I do not fully understand myself. Cool? Cool. So basically, Phantom X, or Charlie Cluster 7, or Weapon 13, or John Philippe, if that's what you want to call him, was experimented on by Weapon Plus and was genetically grown and evolved using Sentinel technology. Thanks to this, he actually has, or had, three brains for independent parallel processing, nanoactive blood, and his primary nervous system is actually a detachable techno-organism called EVA, or EVA. So there's some stuff to unpack there. EVA, or EVA, can fly herself and can generate bioelectric charges to be used as weapons, with Phantom X being both telepathically and symbiotically linked to Eva. His multiple brains allow him to think like a sort of supercomputer similar to Sage, but it also gives him access to two extra personalities, a charmer and a super deadly mutant hunter. He can create extremely powerful illusions and can enter a trance state where he can rapidly heal, and his self supremacy over his body and mind allows him to overcome pretty much anything to complete his mission, including mind control. I can't talk too too much more about him without taking forever, but know that he has enhanced senses, is a dope fighter, and does not create any kind of smell. Please look into this character and try to make sense of him, because I need help. Number two, Somnus. Carl Valentino is actually a new member of Earth's Mutants, first appearing in Marvel's Voices Pride number one in June 2021. But canonically, he's been around for a while. He and Dakin actually had a one night stand in 1967, a one night stand in which Dakin or Dakin dreamt of them having an entire life together, which caused Dakin to retrieve Carl's body in the modern day and bring it to Krakoa for revival. Except this dream was caused by Carl himself. That's because Somnus has the mutant power of one romancy, which I'm almost certain I mispronounced, but I'm kind of proud of myself that I think I didn't. This means he has the ability to enter, broadcast, and even control dreams at will. He can render his opponents unconscious and is also able to bring others into his dreams it's such a unique and interesting power, and it can allow him to live entire lifetimes within a dream, which in my nerd mind tells me he can learn and improve upon skills while dreaming, but don't take my word on that, I just kind of made that up. Only time will tell the multitude of ways his power shall be used in the future. And finally, at number one is Wizkid, a computer genius and novice inventor, Takashi Taki Matsuya kind of has an unfair advantage in the inventor game. That's because Wizkid here has the ability to techno-form materials and rearrange parts of things to function to his specifications, even to the point of being contrary to the laws of nature and science. And he's even recently learned how to manipulate plants and even other mutant powers to create new technology. With this ability comes a natural psionic aptitude for seeing how components can work together, which lets him make things work even better using his mutant powers. 
power. As for the using of other mutant abilities, it basically means he can see the use of individual mutant powers as components, coming together as a larger machine, or even being able to guide the linking and combination of mutant powers to work collaboratively together. So he's almost like a power strategist, which is really cool, on top of the awesome technology he can already create. All this basically comes together to make WizKids someone you would absolutely want on your side, wheelchair and all. Number 10, Crusader. Crusader is the daughter of X-Men team member Rogue and Avenger Captain America. I know. A weird combination. But in the reality of Earth 9811, these two ended up together after the heroes and villains on Battleworld decided to call a truce. Remaining there, they settled down and raised families, putting their differences aside. I'm not sure how their relationship worked with Rogue not really being able to touch people in all of this point, or how she had a child considering that. But perhaps, like on Earth 616, she eventually was able to work through the trauma causing this side effect of her powers. Or perhaps the Captain America of Earth 9811 was immune to her involvement voluntary energy and power draining effects. Either way, Sarah is their daughter. She gets much of her power from her mother, or rather she gets much of her power from the power her mother had absorbed in her day, meaning that Sarah is super strong, durable, and can fly. She is also considered worthy enough to lift Thor's hammer and wields her father's shield. Number 9, Wolverine. I really wanted to put Laura Kinney higher up on this list because, well, I love her so much, but unfortunately the psionics are just always pushing some of my favorite and most powerful characters further down on these lists lists. Those psionics. Oh well. Laura Kinney as X-23 and now Wolverine is still one of the most powerful children of the X-Men around. Some argue that she is more clone, while others argue that she is more biological offspring of Logan, but in reality, she's kind of a bit of both. She was created as a female clone of Wolverine after his genetic material was combined with that of her creator, scientist Sarah Kinney. Sarah noticed that there were damage spots basically in the samples of Logan's genetic material that they had, which was why their cloning process had been a unsuccessful up to this point. And so she used her own genetic material to patch those rough spots, which made Laura a female clone. Sarah was forced to carry Laura to term as a surrogate by her jealous colleague Xander Rice, as punishment for even creating the female clone to begin with, a strategy that admittedly had not been approved. Laura has power similar to her father. She is a regenerative healing factor and was also trained from birth to be a skilled fighter, bodyguard, and assassin. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more Children of the X-Men, there are a lot out there in the multiverse. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Chimera. Chimera is the daughter of Storm and likely Black Panther, who hails from the alternate reality of 13729. Yeah, sadly, Storm and T'Challa have never had a child together in the main continuity. I know, it's a bit of a bummer. Unless they had like a real secret child that we just don't know about yet, but I doubt it. Chimera seems to have inherited the powers of her mother, but also shares a connection to the Earth, which allows her to draw on and harness its energy. She is also also a skilled tracker and can communicate telepathically with animals. I'd also assume as she's the daughter of Storm that she's a skilled combatant as well. As while Storm is more well known for her goddess status and weather manipulation powers, she is also an extremely skilled fighter. And if she's Black Panther's daughter then she should definitely be a skilled fighter. I mean you got two amazing parents that are both amazing fighters. so. Just saying. Number seven, Charles Xavier II. Charles Xavier II is the son of Charles Xavier and Mystique, if you can believe that. I know, it's pretty shocking. Charles Xavier number two was technically born into the reality of Earth 616, where we later find out that while Mystique actually took the form of Moira when giving birth, Charles actually knew that he was in a relationship with Raven, so it wasn't like a trick of hers. They were actually just wanted to be together, I guess. This version of Charles, however, is an all grown up one from the alternate future of Earth 1. 3729. When his powers first manifested, he accidentally killed his adoptive mother and ended up later joining forces with his half brother, Rays, another child of Mystique's sired by Wolverine, another child of the X Men. Charles Xavier II has a brilliant and conniving mind and, like his father, is an immensely gifted telepath, capable of using his powers to bend others to his will. Number 6, Polaris. Polaris is the daughter of Magneto, and while you might not think of Magneto as being an X Men, considering, you know, he started out as an X Men villain, he has also worked with the team before and and even served as a member himself. Heck, at one point, he was in charge of the whole new mutants crew. Let's not forget that. Magneto may have some questionable methods when it comes to getting
getting justice that put him on the spectrum of villain, but I think at the end of the day, he's just trying to do what's best for mutants. Or at least what he thinks is best for mutant kind. Polaris, like her father, also has magnetic based powers, which, like her father, are also pretty impressive. Polaris is considered an alpha level mutant and recently got to join the X Men team herself after being elected to join them in the Krakoan X Men elections. Psychic elections. Imagine if we could all just vote psychically. That would be awesome. That would be so much easier. You would just like sit down and you'd be like, who do I want to vote for? Mmm, done. Number five, Cable. Cable is the son of Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, non X member Madeline Pryor, who later becomes the villain known as the Goblin Queen, and another X man's Jean Grey, who kind of becomes like an adoptive mother, but who also possesses Madeline's memories of raising baby Christopher because comics. Cable is Nathan Christopher Charles Summers, often referred to as just Nathan Summers or really just Cable. Although back in the day we did know him as Baby Christopher. Cable as a baby was kidnapped by Apocalypse and infected with the techno organic virus. This is the only thing that makes him weak-ish, but really he is still amazingly strong as he can even fend off that virus, containing it to one side of his body using his psionic powers. That in and of itself is pretty impressive as the techno organic virus is generally known for being being, well, unstoppable. Even with his psionic powers mainly preoccupied, Cable is still a hard one to beat, as he has so many combatant based skills that he brings to the table, and he is also an experienced time traveler besides. Number four, Rachel Summers. Yes, get ready, because many of the most powerful X Kids out there just happen to be Summers related, so yeah, get ready for that. Honestly, I've always wanted to do a video just to explain the complicated nature that is the Summers and Gray family tree, which honestly is a lot, and it's very timey wimey. Rachel herself is one of those very complex kids of theirs. She is the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers from the alternate Earth of 811. In that reality, she was made into a hound, a weapon used to hunt down mutants, even being one herself. Rachel is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic who also has the ability to chrono skim and manipulate time, even traveling through it. Rachel is also known for being an avatar of the Phoenix, at one time actually considered the true avatar for it, but then later having the power sort of dialed down to a mere echo of it. So she was no longer the true avatar. They were just like, you just have a thing. It's not even like the real Phoenix Forest, but it's like a version of it. Still, the seeming peace or echo of the Phoenix Forest that resides within her has been known to flare up from time to time, or her connection to the Phoenix Force, however we want to see that, occasionally boosting Rachel to an off the charts level of power. But like I said, that doesn't happen all the time. Number three, Hope Summers. Hope is the adopted daughter of Cable, who was originally known as the Mutant Messiah Baby. Cable saved Hope from Bishop, who basically wanted to destroy her. In Bishop's reality, the Mutant Messiah would end up causing the event that led to the oppression and persecution of mutants. However, in Cable's reality, the Mutant Messiah would grow up to become a savior. So you can see why these two were opposed on this topic. For the X-Men of Earth 616, the mutant Messiah was the first new mutant to have been born since basically M-Day, and so she brought hope to the mutants of the 616 reality. Cable body slided with hope to another time to raise her in safety. He would end up naming hope after her adoptive mother, his love who died, Hope, and she got the Summers name from Cable himself. But although she looks a lot like Jean, she actually has no biological relation to the Summers or the Grey families, at least not that we know of. Hope's mutant abilities allow her to to copy the powers of anyone within a certain range. Hope also gains access to these powers without struggling at all to use them, receiving them basically at their peak level and with the, the auto knowledge basically of how to use them. So if you're like, oh, she's gotta like figure it out. No, she's just like instant god mode with those powers basically. Number two, Scarlet Witch. Wanda is known for being one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. She has used her powers to completely warp reality the world over, and her chaos magic has pulled off other immensely world changing feats. Such such as flipping the alignment of all major heroes and villains in the comics during the events of Axis. Initially, her chaos magic powers were believed to be somewhat mutant in origin. In fact, they were kind of presented initially as like jinx like mystical mutant abilities during her first appearances. However, we've since learned that both Wanda and her superpowered brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver, were never really mutants at all, nor were they related to Magneto. However, they still spent a good amount of their life around Magneto, who secretly believed them to be his children, and then another good amount of time thinking that he was their actual father until it was revealed that this was all due to manipulation by the high evolutionary. High evolutionary just coming in and messing pretty much everybody up when it comes to their backstories and origins. Wanda herself has never really gotten along with the X-Men, especially since the events of M-Day, but she is still considered, 
I think, a part of Magneto's family, and a powerful one at that, regardless of her status as a mutant or a non mutant. I know there are some people out there that want to be like, it never happened, but like, they still spent a lot of time together thinking that they were family, so I think we can still count it, friends. Also, make Wanda a mutant again. Do it. Make it happen. Give me Wanda and Quicksilver back. Number one, X Man. X Man is Nathaniel Gray, the lab born child made by combining the genetic materials of both Jean Grey and Cyclops. So basically, like Cable, but if he had been made perfectly by villain Mr. Sinister. He actually hails from the alternate reality of AOA, Age of Apocalypse, Earth 295. Here, Sinister created him to use as his own weapon. But of course, Nate, being so powerful, managed to escape Sinister and instead ended up being raised by Forge of Earth 295. He is considered one of the most powerful mutants of all time, which would also make him one of the most powerful children of the X Men out there. Nate can warp reality, resurrect the dead, resurrect himself, travel to alternate Earths and dimensions, and even manipulate the time stream. He is basically the most OP of characters when it comes to the Marvel Universe. And if you've seen artwork of him, you will probably recognize him as someone who looks like Mutant Jesus, which, yes, he is god level, so that is the point. 